to start. Um, the flag is at the back of the room tonight, so if you would join me for a moment of silent meditation and then the flag. Join me in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Receive minutes from the June 9th meeting. Any comments or a motion? Motion to approve the minutes. Second. Ms. Davis. Ms. Dang. Mr. Kayser. Yes. Mr. Kennedy. Yes. Mr. Moore. Yes. Ms. Perkins. Abstain. Mr. Walter. Yes. All right. Who also received current expenses? Any questions? Motion to approve the expenses as submitted. Second. Ms. Davis. Yes. Mr. Kayser. Yes. Mr. Kennedy. Yes. Mr. Moore. Yes. Ms. Perkins. Yes. Mr. Walter. Yes. <clears throat> All right. Before we get into reports, we have a presentation this evening, and I wanted to uh, allow Chief Kidd to come forward and do that at the outset of our meeting. So. You want to come up? Thank you, Mayor. Um, as several of you may or may not have known, the morning of the 6th of June, we had an apartment fire at the Pleasant Valley Colonies, uh, specifically 351 Stenner Court. Um, while that is not, I guess, necessarily abnormal for us to have a fire, we are the fire department, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> some of the actions of some of the Plain City uh, employees went above and beyond what I would call the normal call of duty. Um, specifically, Officers Prather and Howard uh, were on duty that evening. At approximately 3.10, we received a phone call of an apartment on fire at that address. Uh, it's a five-unit apartment building, so it's a rather large structure. Um, they were there within, I believe, two minutes of the time of call. Uh, Officer Howard was pulling up. Officer Prather was seconds behind him. They found fire coming from the back side of the building, heavy smoke conditions, and reports that there were still folks in the building. Um, without regard for their own personal safety, they started evacuating the, uh, the residents in those uh, five units. I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, Eleanor, it's Betty Bridgeway was the original caller uh, from across the street. We're actually going to uh, be recognizing, recognizing Betty at a later date, I believe it's the 8th of July, they're having a potluck. We wanted to do something similar to this. We wanted to be in their house. That way the, the neighbors and folks that live there in Pleasant Valley Colonies can actually get to, to see, you know, the appreciation we have for the residents and, and for what they've done. But back to the, 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 the fact at hand. Um, there were four people still in the apartments when the officers started evacuating the residences. They were able to actually walk two people out. The third person met them at the door. The fourth person didn't even answer the door. Fortunately, we have a key system built into all of our businesses here in Plain City that allow the police and fire access to those buildings. They made access to the gentleman's apartment. He was still sound asleep. Now, I've been doing this for over 20 years, and I've you know, worked in some of the busiest companies in, in the city of Columbus, and the conditions were deteriorating rapidly. There was heavy black smoke. There was a significant amount of fire. Yeah. Plain and simple, I had already committed resources from the fire department, uh, and Lieutenant Scheider was the officer in charge. I think several of the guys were here from that evening. I actually said, hey, split your crew. I need two guys to the front with me, because I was, I was betting every dollar in my pocket that they were going to have to make entry using our self-contained breathing apparatus because the smoke conditions were bad enough, I, I was surprised that they were able to make entry into the apartment. Uh, they woke the gentleman up, got him out of bed, 
helped him to his scooter. He actually got out of the building with the assistance of the officers. At that point, they started accounting for everybody that was kind of milling around as far as the, the folks there at the apartment complex. And I took some cliff notes, if you will, so that I didn't mess this up. They were there in two minutes of the call. We were there within five minutes. It takes us a couple minutes to get ourselves out the door and moving. Within eight minutes of the time that they arrived, we were able to give what we call an all clear on the structure. What that means is we had everybody accounted for. Eight minutes. Unbelievable time frame. Yeah, it, when I read that number, it said, you know what, something was different about this incident than normal. And it all comes down to this. The day before, the City of London had a similar fire, similar setup, similar units, the whole nine yards. They had a tragic loss of life that night. I truly believe that we would have had a similar outcome had it not been for the actions of both of these officers. Uh, with that said, and these are identical, I just happened to grab Theron's first. I'd like uh, Officer Prather and Howard to come forward. We'll go here to the middle. But we've actually made up the highest award we can actually give within the fire department is the, the fire chief's commendation. And both gentlemen are going to be receiving that award this evening. You want to go where we want to go, guys, so we've got a good. Where's going to be best for your picture? Probably if you go here in front, I can back up a little bit. You don't mind trying to stay out of your way. All right, I'll go with Theron first. All right, I'll come on. Come on behalf back of the Pleasant Valley Joint Fire District, I'd like to award you the Fire Chief's Commendation. Thank you, sir. You got to take that off. It doesn't make yeah, it. Yeah. I mean, I know, I, I know I'd be a lot better looking without that. Again, yeah, on behalf of the Pleasant Valley Joint Fire District, thank you for what you've done for us. Thank you. I would like a photo with both of them. Sergeant, would you like to stand up? As Sergeant Jaskowitz is representing uh, Chief Hill this evening. I believe Chief Hill's on vacation. Uh, I spoke at length with Chief Hill, and you know. Too many times we hear about all the bad things, or hey, there's this problem or that problem, and you know we don't hear about the positive things that happen within our community enough, and can't say enough about what these guys did for for the residents, you know, for us. I mean, it made our job that much easier by them taking care of our first problem. You know, you can get, read any firefighting manual. It says there are three priorities when you pull up at a fire. Life safety, insulate stabilization, property conservation. What that means is we take care of the people first. First and foremost, we want to take care of people. We can't replace them. Second, we take care of making sure that it doesn't get any worse. You know, the easy way to say it is put the fire out. You put the fire out, the problem goes away. And third is property conservation. That's when we make sure that we put tarps. You know, the guys were going back into the apartments making sure that we found valuables, making sure that we found pictures. You know, all those things that are, it's important to us. It's stuff, but it's important to us. You know, the, that's the third thing that we do. They took care of number one. You take care of our first priority, it now allows us to focus on putting that fire out. You know, so it now gave Lieutenant Scheider another option. In fact, it put another, another fire hose into play. And that's the easiest way to say it. it. It allowed his crew to pull a second line off our fire truck. And it, it, the fire goes out faster the more water you can put on. Yeah, so these guys made the difference. And, and like I said, I talked with Chief Hill. He actually sent Charge Jaskowitz tonight to represent him. So if we can get both of you two in between Sarge and I, we'd appreciate that. And we'll have her snap a couple more pictures, and then I'll let you get to, back to the... Uh, <laughs> yeah, upside down. It is for me. The term mugshot comes to mind. There's no number for it. You're good. So, again, thank you for your time tonight. Thank you, Chief. Thank you. Mayor, thank you again for allowing me a few minutes of your meeting. I do certainly appreciate that. Yes. I um, emailed both officers immediately after. <laughs>
finding out, and they know my appreciation, and certainly proud of them and our police force. So, yes, sir. Sandy, I don't know your, your protocol, but can I say one thing? Sure. Sure. As president of the uh, Place Senior Center's Board of Trustees, I also would like to thank both of you and Chief Kidd, Lieutenant Snyder, for your uh, work and, and what you really accomplished. And yes, we are very thankful and very blessed in that nobody was hurt, either the residents or any of the first responders. So again, thank you very much. We appreciate it. Thanks to the fire department. I know some of you uh, don't live in town and indicated that, so you're more than welcome to go ahead and leave if you'd like. Um, all right, so moving forward with our agenda. Um, Renee, do you have anything? And Sergeant Jeskowitz is here this evening for the chief, who is like chief Smith's been on vacation. So did you have a report? Um, the only thing that uh, we had to report was just uh, the success of a previously reported uh, training that we held here at the fire department, um, the craze training. Um, it was uh, pretty successful. We had about 30 people. We've had a lot of people express interest since then, hoping that we put on another course, which we, uh, we do hope to do and plan to do uh, later this year. Great. Thank you. Any questions? All right. Administrator. Um, just to let you know, we do have a pre-con meeting for the uh, water tower clean and paint project. It is this Friday. Um, I know there was some discussion amongst your group uh, about the color and, and what's going to be on that tank. Um, looking for some direction with what you want to do there. We don't really have to decide tonight, but be thinking about it. And uh, I'll get a little bit more idea of what our choices are on Friday. But uh, that has to be done. That decision has to be pretty quick. I threw out the idea of perhaps soliciting advertisement, especially for the Dutchman. I mean, if we can get, I don't know, several thousand, tens of thousands of dollars a year in advertising, it seems like a good idea. You know, I didn't get much much of a reception with that, but I like the idea. I mean, it's not as if Plain City isn't already synonymous with the Dutchman in any way. Um, barring any legal issues, I think it's a good way to make additional revenue in the village at no cost. <clears throat> absent the cost of putting up whatever they want on there. And I think the website is a good suggestion for one of as well. I don't know why it's yeah, good. I like it. um, We've got two water towers. We do. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, that has to be a question. Or we could paint them in place. I don't know. <laughs> um, any other thoughts there? Anyone else? Um, there's no legal there's issue. No. no, it's no different than if you're erecting a cell tower and attaching it to a, a city or village structure. So let me ask then is anyone opposed to that? It would certainly be long-term advertising because it's not going to get paid right. for many years. Mm -hmm. right. So, yeah, it'd be a long contract. And maybe that's part of any agreement that they maintain their whatever they put on there. That that's their responsibility. Um, we can, if, knowing that you're okay with that, we can. Yeah, we have time. That'll be the, the last thing done. Obviously, yeah. we've got a couple of tanks to. To get cleaned up first. Um, the more pressing question is the color. Do we want to keep the color of the towers the same? Do we want to change? Um, I think the white and blue is, uh, it blends a lot better with the sky than, than a sharp color. So, Is there some functional reason why light blue? In other words, you don't want to heat the water as much, whereas a darker color would heat the water inside. I mean, is that an issue? I always thought it was so it wouldn't, you know, stand out so much. Uh, I could be wrong, but you know, most, most of the to towers the sky, are, are pretty benign color. So. Unless you're trying to get attention. <coughs> yeah. 
With advertisement. I've seen towers like the one on South Jefferson painted to look like a golf ball. <laughs> or a peach. <laughs> Can you maybe find out what colors are available? I mean, sure. Like, I'm assuming it's a specific paint that they use is. for those, so they probably only have a limited amount of colors. And maybe we could discuss it at our working session. Or is that soon enough? We agree on doing something like, you know, that across it to match our website. I mean, I think our website background here is white. I mean, I don't know, it might help if we determine what we're going to put on before we determine the background color. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The, the advertising idea, uh, I don't know that we can limit that just to one merchant in town. We'd probably have to do it on a fair basis. <coughs> so. Of course, the price, price might limit a lot of yeah. businesses. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah, you're right. Okay, after our meeting Friday, then I'll, I'll get some additional information out to y'all. Do we still have the buzzer problem? <laughs> on the yeah, they're down there. Can we do anything about that? Not in the scope of this project. Take the railing off or anything? I don't know, Chuck. Um, I'm sure they would approach anyhow on the top or somewhere. <laughs> somewhere in the crisscrosses of the it's legs. You can electrify it. All right. Anything All right. else? Yep. Um, mosquito fogging will begin this Wednesday. We'll be fogging from 8:30 to 11:30. The alternate date for spraying will be the following evening, Thursdays. Uh, for the same times, we'll no longer be spraying in the mornings as an alternate uh, fogging schedule. Uh, also, our Public Utilities Clerk attended a utility billing software training conference uh, about two weeks ago and came back with some really good information from that. We also received restitution for the fuel thefts that had occurred. And uh, speaking of utility billing, we have a new online um, payment gateway and it is up and running. The new web portal gives our our customers access to their own water and sewer uh, bills with real-time viewing of their account, including account history and, and many more options. They can edit their personal information as well as make uh, payments and recurring payments if they choose uh, immediately online with real-time. And unless there's any questions, that's all I have. Thank you. All right. A um, couple issues from the last meeting. Uh, I did uh, send correspondence to uh, Mr. Frick with the uh, PCABA regarding the parade issue and with regard to the speed limits within the uh, park, uh, telling him that uh, we need to make sure that our coaches are aware of, of uh, first of all, keeping the speed limits during the baseball season down and staying within the speed limits and also advising you know, the police are present throughout the park and if somebody's speeding, they have every right to get ticketed for that. And also with regard to the candy uh, for the parades, obviously we don't have another parade this year, but in advance of the next parade, we need to have a sit down with the coaches and have a clear understanding of supervision of the student of the, of the players on the parade floats. Um, and then we wanna, we'd like to maintain uh, the parades as we've had them, but we need to do it safely and, and with respect. And that's pretty much it for that issue. Um, I believe at the last meeting, uh, Mr. Kayser asked me to do some work on the role of social media as far as Sunshine, sunshine Line in advance of the uh, July work session. Um, this is a developing area of the law. There isn't anything really specific. Um, the, the only issues that arise are if a person is acting in their official capacity versus their individual capacity. And the, the law is kind of, you know, we have generalized laws uh, as to form. Uh, discussions with council members. Obviously, if you're discussing a public issue and deliberating and voting on a public issue, that is not something to be done outside of a public meeting. It has to be done in the meeting only. So there has to be some caution. Uh, I understand, you know, obviously all the various social networks and tweeting and all that stuff. 
uh, that you, it's, it's treated no different than any kind of uh, serial phone calls or serial emails where if you're, you can't round robin a vote, you can't round robin a discussion on something. Um, that being said, you also are not inhibiting the ability of council to bring something to the rest of council's attention via social media or by email. Um, if somebody says, you know, hey, I got a great idea for the water tower, here's what it is, you know, for painting the water tower, feel free to circulate it. We're not deliberating that, we're not discussing it outside of a public meeting, and we're not making a decision on it, uh, so long as that then comes up in discussion uh, for deliberation later. Um, so, generally speaking, uh, the, the real issue comes down to is whether it is a truly private uh, discussion uh, on a forum, or is it a, is it a public for, uh, discussion in the context of what uh, that person's official capacity is. Um, and under those circumstances, that, that's always fact-based and, and will be determined by the court if we ever got to that. But uh, hopefully everybody is mindful of the general requirements that whatever we do here uh, as a public body must be done in public. Any voting deliberations, all that has to be taken take place right here in this meeting uh, in front of the public. Um, the other issue I have is the uh, Ordinance for the unauthorized use of uh, village property, which I'll pass around here in a second. And the final issue um, that was brought up at the last meeting and dealt with uh, the uh, sale of the, uh, of the that zero-turn mower. I think there was a discussion on that, and there was a request for me to uh, determine whether or not um, the village has the authority to donate property. Um, there's kind of two parts to my answer on this. The first part is, there's nothing in statute that authorizes the village to sell, or to, I, I should say, to donate property to anyone. Um, the statute is very clear that, the, that I think it's 715.01, the revised code specifically provides that the village can, can buy, sell, or lease property, including personal property. It does not say buy, sell, lease, or donate you know, within the following provisions. Uh, there's nothing in the Ohio Revised Code, there's nothing in the state, matter of fact, there's case law on it, but I think the most recent case on it was back in 1965, and it appears to be still a good law, that said that there is nothing that authorizes, that there is no authority to donate uh, public property. And uh, my, my belief and my understanding of this is because technically, every piece of property that is owned by the village is owned by the people of the village. We all, you know, every taxpayer has a stake in that, and so for the a council to sit there and parse out what they're, you know, what they want to give away and to whom they want to give it away, it's fraught with problems if you do that. Um, so my first answer is no, we can't do it. We can't donate it. The second issue is, uh, in, in going through the facts again with Chief uh, Hill um, and discussing it with him in detail as far as the timing and everything, it. it Clearly, the insurance company was aware uh, of the theft of this mower. The claim was submitted. The claim was paid. At that point, pursuant to the terms of the insurance contract, it became the property of the insurance company. Now, we are, as a public entity, free to accept and keep things that are donated to us, and that's really what the insurance company did. They basically told us to keep the mower. They didn't want to go through the expense of collecting it and then trying to sell it or do whatever, so they left it with us. Um, so at that point, that became public property. That became the property of the village, and again, we can't do anything with it. So once that insurance claim was paid off in full, there is nothing further that could be done. So that's all I have to say about that. Um, otherwise, I think that's all I had to report. Great, thank you. Any questions? So didn't we last time amend the resolution to <coughs> take the lower out? Right. So, so then go. Can we re-amend it to put the mower back in, or do we need a new resolution to sell the mower? We voted on, that was, was that the second reading? Mm -hmm. um, I think if we're going to do that, we would have to make this the second reading again, do a, do a re-over. Because we, we voted with it at the first reading with it included, and we passed it. We'd have to do this again as a second reading, a new second reading, including it back in. So there'd have to be a motion to do that, and then, uh, and then a vote. Great. Um, that will come up here in a few minutes in our own business. Okay, is there anyone here? I don't see John Rucker here. Anyone that wants to report to Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, planning and zoning. <coughs> yes. 
we met on Wednesday and um, previously Agape had come and we had said that we couldn't do um, the changes they needed because of the EPA. They did reach out to the EPA. The EPA has actually approved it and so they can go forward. However, then we found that it was four and a half, four and a half feet. feet over the amount, so we gave them the option to either make it smaller to fit within the compounds of um, the ordinance or to take it to BZA. So, and I don't know if he was going to take it to BZA if he's contacted you. He is going to take it to BZA. Okay. For variance. So, it's coming your way. And then, um, I believe at the last council meeting, I know I was out, but I believe the wind energy, the sandwich boards, and the B3 changes were distributed. They went by email, right? Yeah, they went uh, by email before that meeting. I don't think we discussed them, because I think they went out late. Do you want to discuss them now, or do you want sure. to wait till Thank you. So I will tell you, I'm not real familiar with the wind energy. I came in at the end of that when you guys had made most of the approvals and changes to that. Um, it did, we did use what I believe Marysville had had previously with alternative energy. Was there specific questions on that? This, they, again, the, the proposed, or at least for the purposes of discussion and what was agreed to by P, uh, P and Z, was the same um, ordinance uh, that uh, Marysville uses. Obviously, uh, that is going to be edited to uh, make the appropriate changes, but otherwise, uh, the remainder of it is intact. Uh, there aren't any substantive changes to be made. We spoke in last time about the fall radius. Is what are the requirements there? In other words, I'm assuming if it's, let's say, 50 feet tall, that there needs to be a fall radius in excess of 50 right. feet. The diameter, or the radius on each side needs to be 50 feet. And actually, if you look uh, within here, it's 1.1 times the total height. Um, so if you're dealing with 100 foot, and, and I don't even think, matter of fact, if I recall correctly, right. it doesn't even prefer, permit anything so that high. Um, no. Just as an example. Yeah. Right. So it would have to be 110 foot fall radius. And is that codified, is that Ohio law, or is that just no, something that Marysville, Marysville has created? Right, yeah, there's no state statute on it. Right. Is there a restriction for electromagnetic interference? I don't remember if there was or was not. Um, I don't believe that there is. I think we need to look at that. Okay. For generating energy and electromagnetic interference could cause problems for neighbors. Actually, it could cause problems with police communications, uh, fire communications. And I believe these are all, um, we have a limitation on the size, and these are all small, small wind energy uh, apparatus. Does anybody here know anything about such a device? I mean, is the electrical energy actually generated within the tower? Is it generated somehow underground? Does it go somewhere? I mean, how does that work? It can be used on site. I believe it's only for on site for your so own. So it's immediately generated there right. and just given locally. Right. You, it's not a, you're not establishing a utility for other people to be using off of yours. It's only for your own property. And it's the, the limit is between two kilowatts and five megawatts. Uh, so that may um, that may very well have some bearing, and I'll look into it on the electromagnetic interference uh, having a lower uh, wattage. Again, this is not like your typical wind wind farm that you would see out as you head out towards uh, you know, uh, Van Wert or something like that, where you have big giant fields of them. Because frankly, with the fall radius, you're not going to fit anything in this village if that's if that's that tall. I mean, those are as tall as our water tower, and we don't have room for another water tower. tower. So. Um, but yeah, I'll take a look at the uh, at the electromagnetic interference. And if you guys want, uh, you can look at this again. And if you have other questions, you can email those to me. Well, on page 309, it does say signal interference. The owner of a small wind energy project must take reasonable steps to prevent and eliminate inter interference with transmission and reception of electromagnetic communications, such as microwave, radios, telephones. Oh, the original? Okay. Right. Yeah. 
So it does have something in there. And then it goes on down about wiring electrical apparatuses. Right. So I, I can take a look at that and I'll circulate an email to all of you uh, kind of defining that some more. And if you want to discuss it some more at the next meeting, we can do that. And then <clears throat> B3 changes um, were regarding the um, changes in the not allowing residential on the main floor in the B3 district. I don't know if you guys had any questions on that? I know we had talked about that previously. Are we okay to approve that then? We can. What do we? We'll pass those out in a minute. Um, Everybody should already have yeah. that. Yeah. So we'll have, go ahead with the third one. And then, and then the third one was the um, sandwich board signs. Um, we had made some changes to the ordinance corner of that. properties. Corner, corner properties, allowing <laughs> um, a second sign for corner properties. And the up two. Now this would be, uh, would we draft a, a ordinance or a resolution to bring that forward? Right. Okay. Yes. Yeah, I think as it is now, each of those would be amendments to existing ordinances. Like wind energy would be a brand new ordinance that we'd have to shoehorn in there somewhere in our ordinances, where these two would be amendments to what we already have. What you have is the draft of what it would look like. I think I did it with a marked up version so you could see the highlighted and the stricken language. Um, but yeah, then, we, then so you consider that, if you agree to that, then I will go back and put a final version together and then do a resolution to approve that particular ordinance change. So if you're okay with any of those, mm -hmm. I'm going to take a motion to move forward with. So Paul can draft an ordinance. Need a motion for all three? No, um, we're going to hold off on the wind, so if, you want, if you're okay with the other two. A motion to move forward to, with amending the B3 district and the site. Second. Second. Ms. Davis. Yes. Mr. Kayser. Yes. Mr. Kennedy. Yes. Mr. Moore. Yes. Ms. Perkins. Yes. Mr. Walter. Yes. Great. Thank you. Okay. BCA. I don't think we have a meeting yet. Well, one was planned for July 10th, but Mr. Lafayette cannot attend, so I have not heard anything. Is scheduling? Yeah, we're working on rescheduling. Okay. Do we have the time on the first one? Uh, we're within it right now, but it's going to be close by the time you get back. Where do you get? You've got a 30 day time frame to get that in. So. Okay. Well, if we need to do it sooner, we can do that as well. Okay. Yeah, they just can be calling you. Okay, um, anything on CIC? Uh, attended a Union County CIC meeting two weeks ago. Um, really nothing major to report. And we have a Madison County CIC meeting tomorrow night at 6 o'clock. David? Yep. 6 o'clock. <laughs> okay, present for 10 in Parks, please. Um, nothing for President Pro Tem. Uh, for Park, we have set a meeting for July 23rd at 6 p.m. Council Chambers, so getting some agenda items for that, so if you have anything. Other uh, items is discussion of the possibility of Ball Diamond in Park. Mm -hmm. so I don't know if you have things you'd like to talk about July 23rd. I've got a question. What are they going to do about restrooms that we tore down for the, <laughs> for the steam <laughs> thrashers? <laughs> I was just looking, asking what we were planning on doing with the restrooms. Um, we have lots of activities out there. I mean, we have the scene freshers coming up with the 4th of July, and we've basically taken out six to eight unusable bathrooms, unusable bathrooms that we don't have now. 
Uh, yeah, well, they're unusable before, so really no different situation than we were, but that's a great question. Now, well, I guess we have the youth building. What are our options? There is restrooms at the youth building. There's restrooms at the north end, uh, campground shower facilities, and there's also uh, porta pots at uh, the baseball area. Um, as I as I recall, Parks discussed this, and the decision was uh, once that was, that building was torn down, that if there was a large event, it would be up to the event committee or up to that event uh, entity to figure out what their restroom needs were and to provide those for themselves. But when it comes to Fourth of July. We are going to be paying $325 for our parade. We will be paying $335 for restrooms out of the volunteer money. We won't be able to use the Port of Johns at the ballpark because they will be in the uh, roped off area. It's just an expense that people don't need. What are you suggesting? I'd like to see the village cover it. I mean, we're the ones that have taken out those. We don't have a plan in place to put them back in as part of the committee of 4th of July. We're taking on what the city was paying before to help our residents to for an event that's for the residents. We'll probably have 2,000 people out there July 4th. The, the restrooms in the youth building is one man, one woman. And if you've been to any sporting event, you've seen the line for the women, and I think it's just going to be an invitation for trouble for somebody to be standing behind the tree. It's fair to that. say we can't get anything built before that happens. Correct. I'm sure we can get some options as to what the cost would be for whatever size, and then we can look at it. I mean, I, I agree with you ladies that we need to provide something. Well, maybe this one pressures after that. And, I mean, I don't know if you're planning, have you told them already? Or are they planning on bringing their own? Because they bring quite a big crowd, and they're actually paying us to have problem. it. Well, I they know got a contract. Okay, okay wait, 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 wait. This is not um, for visitors <laughs> right now. This is council discussion. I appreciate you wanting to interject, but let us try to figure it out. Anyway, why don't we get some prices on what it would cost to do, you know, on various levels of putting them back in, and we can actually have a discussion as to whether it's... Well, 4th of July is next week. Right, right. we can't get that bill before 4th of July, no matter what. Well, we no, yeah. no, but we had our our explosion over the weekend. The Plan City Events Committee did, out of their funds, pay for three port johns to the tune of $335. The art explosion was totally free. We didn't charge anybody for setting up. We didn't charge anybody for coming in, but we paid for that out of Plain City Events funds. So now we're going to come back around to July 4th and pay for three Porta Johns again. And what does that cost? $335. For three stops. For I mean, three. Personally, I'm all for the village paying that. It's the least we can do. We're not. That's what I'm asking. It's a public for. service, so. Because we are already going to be paying $325 for our parade. <coughs> All right, so a motion to pay for the three hundred and some dollars for the port bodies on the fourth of July? No, they don't have to pay for the port bodies. City pays for the port zones for the fourth of July. Ms. Davis. Yes. Mr. Kayser. Yes. Mr. Kennedy. Yes. Mr. Moore. Yes. Ms. Perkins. Yes. Mr. Walter. Yes. Thank you. I would also like to, just part of my part presentation, introduce a motion to, and I don't know if this is ever discuss this, I don't remember it is, but uh, to not charge for park rental that day, the 4th of July, I mean, but we, just to go on record, right, um, we normally would charge for the use of the park, I want to make sure it's in the minutes that uh, the, the village, village wants to charge the people of the village to put on their 4th of July event. Well, if my family who lives in the village, if they wanted to rent the park. But you're not doing it for the people of the village, so, you're putting it on for a private situation. <clears throat> Anyway, you can vote no on it, I guess, if you aren't opposed or if you're opposed to it. Okay. I, mean, uh, I just think it's important that we state this because um, it should just be on the record that uh, the village is donating the park for that day. 
So I moved that the village <laughs> donate the park to the Fourth of July party. Uh, that was already understood. But, yeah, but see, understanding is not what we need here. We need a resolution. So it's been seconded. Ms. Davis. Yes. Mr. Kayser. Yes. Mr. Kennedy. Yes. Mr. Moore. Yes. Ms. Perkins. Yes. Mr. Walter. Yes. Okay. Anything else from her? No. Okay. Personnel finance? Nothing to report. Fire. Fire. We got uh, <coughs> we got six new recruits in the fire department, and they passed the medical test now and everything, and they're ready to learn the procedures and that, how the fire department works in Plain City. And uh, they're ready to go to work. And the second thing we have coming up is a replacement levy, a 10 mil, that'll be on this fall for the fire department. And about, uh, other than that, that's about it. You said it's a replacement levy? Replacement levy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the levy that will be in November is a 10 mil levy that will actually replace the current 10 mil levy that is due to expire at the end of this year. Okay. Any questions? Thank you. Yeah. Okay. That's the end of our report. Old business. We have the third reading of resolution 1014, which is the 2014 budget amendment. Motion to pass the reading of 1014. Second. Ms. Davis. Yes. Mr. Kayser. Yes. Mr. Kennedy. Yes. Mr. Moore. Yes. Ms. Perkins. No. Mr. Walter. Yes. All right. Third reading of resolution 1214. Um, that's going to be the second. Yeah. Yes. So I think we want to change that back to the second reading and to. Um, so the motion needs to be that we're changing it back um, and putting back in the zero turn mower. Um, okay. So does someone want to make that motion? Motion to approve the second reading of 1214. Second. Ms. Davis. Yes. Mr. Kayser. Yes. Mr. Kennedy. Yep. Mr. Moore. Yes. Ms. Perkins. Yes. Mr. Walter. Yes. So how do you Just to clarify, the second reading of that one would have been for we going back to do the second reading, including the mower back. Yes. Correct. Right. Okay. Second reading of resolution 1314, state purchasing contract. Motion to approve 1314 for second reading. Thanks, Lyndon. Ms. Davis. Yes. Mr. Kayser. Yes. Mr. Kennedy. Yes. Mr. Moore. Yes. Ms. Perkins. Yes. Mr. Walter. Yes. All right. In new business, you, uh, Mr. Lafayette, just passed out an ordinance that is um, establishing an ordinance prohibiting unauthorized use of village property. You've seen the language before, and you've not seen it drafted in an ordinance. Are you all okay to move forward with this? Exhibit A is what we've seen before. Exhibit, yes. Exhibit A has been circulated. Yes. You guys had that. Um, the thing that you haven't seen is the just the cover sheet, the the ordinance to pass the ordinance. What was the ordinance? Three, three dash fourteen. Three dash fourteen. You have a motion. I make a motion to approve the first reading of three dash fourteen. Second. Ms. Davis. Yes. Mr. Kayser. Yes. Mr. Kennedy. Yep. Mr. Moore. Yes. Ms. Perkins. Yes. Mr. Walter. Yes. Thank you, Council. All right. Um, this evening we have guests with us this evening that we want to give some time to. Ms. Perkins, would you like to introduce them? Oh, yes. Um, from GGC Engineers, we have um, Kevin and Michael Carter, and they're going to give us a little presentation. Kevin and I have worked with them a couple of times, and they uh, did a beautiful 
revitalization of the, the small village of Lithopolis, and we're hoping they can help us do something with Plain City. So I'll just turn it over to you. Thank you so much. Um, very quickly, my name is Mike Carter. I'm president of GGC. I have with me here tonight Brian Winkler. He's the vice president of GGC. And strangely enough, we have done work for the village before. We probably don't remember. It was quite some time ago. It was back in 1996. We did a water treatment plant project for it and stuff. But in the meantime, uh, a little bit about us is we work primarily with villages, counties, water and sewer districts, stuff like that. Small cities, we stay away from the big cities because they're not that much fun to work with. I know that's really surprising. But, um, a while ago I had a discussion with Kevin and we talked about downtown revitalization projects and he had just recently completed one in Lithopolis, Ohio. And uh, as a firm, we really, really enjoy doing them. They're a lot of fun. Uh, you get to roll up your shirt sleeves with people and get a lot of input from all the sh stakeholders and find out what it is you know, you'd like to do. And we've been involved in some challenging projects in Lithopolis, which has a lot of parallels to Plain City in that you know, they had all these telephone poles, some of them electrical poles, some of them were getting ready to fall down and everything, and it really took a lot away from what was a really scenic, pleasant little village that likes to hold festivals. They have the Lithopolis Honey Fest there in August. It's kind of a big event for them. It's weekend long now. So we got talking about street projects and found there would be a lot of enthusiasm in talking with Leslie and Kevin about perhaps doing something here. And then we were tasked with coming up with some scenarios of what could be done. And um, Brian was responsible for most of them, putting them together. And uh, we discussed some of that last week. And very quickly, um, Brian will start on this PowerPoint here, but before we get talking more about specifics for Plain City, I'd like to show you some other things that we've done. That it's always fun. You can drag ideas from projects you've done in the past, come up with new ones. And uh, Mayor, I hate to do this to you, but I'm, have to, I'm sure you don't want to be blinded here. But I'll show you those projects, and then Brian will take over, and he promises me his presentation is going to be just as exciting as that soccer game the other day. So, without the last 30 seconds. Yeah. <laughs> you want lights out? Uh, it might help, yeah. Okay. Make sure I'm okay. Just a couple additional up here. If, uh... Very quickly, one of the things that we get involved with, with villages and small cities is there comes a time where you have all this growth occurring when you're outlining areas. And what happens then, it takes what could be somewhat of a nice, scenic, vibrant downtown area and it relocates them to the outskirts. So what happens, your downtown loses its identity. Uh, we worked for the city of Cuyahoga Falls. <laughs> And they had a situation where they had all these shopping malls and all this stuff occur on the outskirts, and people forgot there was a downtown. So we uh, did a project for them to recenter things back downtown. And I know that you're not looking at anything like this, but this was perhaps the coolest assignment an engineering firm could ever get, and that's design us a place where we can throw parties and have a festival. Because they were having these weekend long festivals down there. Dancing water fountain, the lights and the music, and the sound stage is particularly neat. But what really made it safety and access to some high end restaurants. So that's one of the things we did. I hope this works. In Gahanna, where our office is located, they did a uh, similar project down there a couple years ago. Unfortunately, the timing wasn't real good upon some bad economic challenges. but. We were involved in that project down there too. And they had the same situation. They had horrible electrical and power poles. You know, one of them fell over uh, in a bad storm one night and shut down the entire street. So we took all that, relocated to the rear alleys and downtown. And did a few other things under there. But that's and, and if you've been down there lately, they had a big festival there last weekend. The place is just thriving now. It was really turning around. 
This is a, a smaller project for Cuyahoga Falls. And this was an area that they wanted some traffic calming. Uh, people just speeding and blasting and blowing through there. It's a 25 mile an hour limit, no one ever did 25. But they also wanted to beautify it because they had some um, shops, a couple restaurants that they wanted to see thrive again in what was kind of a neglected part of the neighborhood. So, um, see that big kiosk right there? They actually kicked things off by calling it Chestnut Crossing. They gave it its own name. So now everybody says, well, you know, where are you going to go to dinner soon? Go, well, let's go to a place called Chestnut Crossing. So, and I'll turn things over to Brian here just so we can talk about things specific to Plain City. Thank you. Um, as Mike mentioned, uh, we're a firm in Gahanna, Ohio, and uh, love doing these type of projects. And uh, worked in the city before. I live uh, just down the street, just outside of Plain City in the uh, small metropolis of Dublin. So, <laughs> familiar with uh, this area quite a bit. But the area we were, were tasked to look at, talking with Kevin and Leslie, mainly was, uh, was Main Street, basically from the from the library, and I'm going to use this nifty little pointer thing. Um, here's your here's the library, and here's the old 42. Um, so really, kind of this area along Main Street is what we looked at. Um, some different options, mainly just looking at beautifying, uh, making a lot more pedestrian, a lot more business friendly for the area get a destination point for people to come to, spend their evenings, go to, go to a restaurant, go to a shop, that type of thing. So what can we do to do that? Um, the sidewalks down there, I'm sure as you walked, are getting to be dilapidated. The sidewalks are cracking, the curb is gone in a lot of places. So, there we go. Um, I'll, it will blow up a little bit in a second. But this is just a uh, depiction of you have a 13-foot sidewalk from the edge of your building to the curb, which is great. I mean, go through any area and to have a 13-foot sidewalk is just a luxury for the village to have. Uh, very pedestrian friendly. So we took part of that and created a 4-foot wide landscape strip and a nine foot wide sidewalk. Still very pedestrian friendly, able for the businesses to get people in and out of. And this is kind of a blow up of that typical cross section. Um, here's that four foot grass strip. We put a light pole, put trees in that area. <clears throat> There's another paper blow up of what's going on over there if, uh, that helps at all. But there's some tree locations in between the trees are light poles. Yeah, and this is a depiction of the crosswalk. This is stamped asphalt that we looked at. Very uh, maintenance friendly also is to use stamped asphalt. And it's getting to be a lot more economical. People are doing it more. Uh, people are getting easier. Work. It's getting easier for contractors to work with. Um, we looked at three different options. Here's the second option. This is uh, almost the same thing what you just saw except with brick edging um, instead of the grass landscaped edging. Uh, very walkable. And the other thing we looked at is kind of these, you see these bump outs. And I'll get to that a little more specifically on the next slide. But um, So again, the four foot wide section that can be done either with brick pavers or one thing we encourage is stamped asphalt, colored and stamped asphalt. And that's actually what you see right here. That's a picture of stamped asphalt um, right along the streetscape. And again, I didn't put any trees or light poles in here, but that's one thing that can be put into that area also. And then the third option. Um, one thing we've heard a lot from Kevin is businesses want parking. Okay? You need people to get in and out of. So one thing we looked at is to add parking to the area. Um, there's some other ideas I know the village is looking at, but 
we also looked at adding some parking to the street itself. Um, right now, you currently have three lanes. I'm going to flip flop a little bit here. As you approach Chillicothe Street or the old 42, you have three lanes of traffic. A center turn lane basically is what you have. So with 42 being taken out and the uh, bypass installed, what, five, seven years ago, something like that, um, you don't have the amount of traffic as you do anymore through the downtown area. So we're, we'll be able to eliminate that turn at turn uh, lane. So that allows us to put some a lot more angled parking in that area. Easier to get in, in and out of. It's actually a traffic calming also because in order to back out, traffic has to stop for you to get at, in and out of that little spots. Um, slows traffic down. I know your speed limit through there is 25. Um, I travel through there quite a bit, heading to 70. I know people don't go to 25 most of the time through there. Uh, plus you have large trucks still going through there using the 161. So uh, this would calm the area down, make it a lot more pedestrian friendly. Again, highlight the uh, crosswalks with the brick asphalt. Um, this is one area I did not blow up, but that's an alley that could be closed off. Throw some bike racks, landscaping, uh, brick pavers or stamped asphalt or stamped concrete in that area. Lots of options basically to look at. But the main thrust is traffic calming, pedestrian friendly, and business friendly. Get some businesses in there, revitalize that some of those buildings. One area also we looked at, and I'm gonna sorry, new clicker for me. I'm not used to this. Um, is the area right in here can also be a destination point or a small gathering area for the village. You have the mural on the building right here. Um, this alley can also be closed off and put in some brick pavers, some benches, um, landscaping, and I can blow that up a little more. There we go. So yes, the real estate office I think someone mentioned is is right here, and there's still adequate. There's still some parking there. We did not show some parking he has in front also here, but uh, there is room to have a little small gathering space. I mean, we can put benches throughout the sidewalk, but that is a small little gathering space with some uh, landscaping and my fun PowerPoint. That gives you a small little depiction of what goes on there. Excuse some of my PowerPoint, but... Uh, <laughs> so again, that's uh, just some landscaping, some benches in there, um, the brick pavers, the brick edging with the sidewalk. Um, but one thing I didn't elaborate on that is depicted quite well in this picture is you don't see the maze of power poles and wires. And that's really another thing that we're trying to achieve here. This is a replacement traffic signal um, with everything underground or moved to the back rear alleys. You have, you have, sorry. there's overhead power already back here. There's overhead power back here. Um, we preliminarily talked with AEP to move everything to the rear alleys and get it off of your main strip or main street. So that gets rid of, you see all the drawings I have here and images. There's no power poles. I know most of them are on this side of the street, but there's no maze of wires going back and forth on the road. In about five, ten years, those power poles are going to have to be replaced anyways because you look at them. One of the days I was out here taking pictures, actually, um, you had a crew coming in. I assumed worked for AEP. They were actually based out of Texas. We 
repairing some of these power poles. They said they did over 200 in town. So just uh, putting bands on them, just kind of hold them together for another three, five years so that we don't have to replace them right now. Um, again, showing the angled parking, the bump outs for traffic calming, more pedestrian space, um, more eating area for the pizza place that's right down, 42 Grill, Clubhouse, Roadhouse, Clubhouse. 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 thank you. 42 Grove House, um, just down here, um, or seating area for them. And light poles, but uh, here are the traffic lights, or traffic signals. Um, minimized, took one out of this area here, put a pole here, three poles basically. Um, minimize as much as possible, put everything on the ground, clean it up a little bit. That's like it. So here's your single power pole, overhead light, um, with your signal pole, signal lights. Um, still operation the same that it is now without the maze of wires, without everything dangling down, without the old wooden poles sticking out. So that's, again, what we're um, looking at, some of the ideas still in preliminary stages, but different options you can look at. So everybody's wondering what's it going to cost, of course. So very preliminarily, we looked at the option of not the angled parking lit initially. I'm oh, sorry, I keep going back and forth, but roughly this this setup with the bump outs, keeping the uh, traffic situation the way it is right now. And bottom line, I want to point out a few of these large numbers you're looking at. AEP cost is your 300000 right here. So that's for AEP to take their power lines, move them to the rear, uh, put them in the back alleys. And then getting your biggest cost is going to be your traffic pole, traffic lights. Getting every all the maze of wires right there on the intersection, it's about a half million dollars. That is a big chunk, I will say, right up front to do. Um, everything else is basically aesthetics. Um, sidewalk, um, sidewalk with a stamped brick finish, um, your, your ADA crosswalks. Street lighting, um, and all these street lights are going to have the base with plug-ins for Christmas lights or lighting, uh, festival lighting, any other type of lighting. You'll have plug-ins for anything you need underneath. So I understand that's a big chunk, and I am going to pass it on to David here, <laughs> David Kell with uh, Madison. I'll let sure. you introduce, but. Uh, We've looked at some different funding options, um, very preliminarily, and there is funding sources available for this. So. Okay, my name is David Kell with Madison County Community, Community Improvement Corporation, so not for profit uh, development organization in Madison County. Um, just wanted to touch on some possible funding sources that we have looked at for, for the project as a whole, and uh, just referring back to previous slide in your mind, we're really, for these program, for these different programs, we're focusing on really the first seven lines or where these are going to help a whole lot. Um, first is a program with the Ohio Department of Transportation called the Transportation Alternatives Program. Uh, this is a program that's focused on uh, improving transportation uh, opportunities for non-motorized um, vehicles or, or modes of transportation. So sidewalks, safe routes, so crosswalks, um, and, and there's other things with regards to historic preservation and scenic environmental um, uh, 
entities that, that this program focuses on. Uh, I did, they asked for me to put the, uh, how much funding is available with each of these programs and also the process. Uh, please review, um, it, it does get kind of complicated, but a lot of these programs also, they do ask for local match or local contributions and there's different sources. I know some communities, uh, back where I originally worked in Green County, they used uh, different programs from different um, different agencies as match dollars, and then there's also local, local dollars from the from the community through various means to um, support these types of projects and gain this type of funding. Uh, Ohio Department of Development Development Services Agency has a community development block grant. Uh, there's actually two different programs within the, within the block grant program, and that's the Community allocation program, uh, community allocation portion, and so every every year, uh, counties and then certain communities uh, receive grant dollars that can be put towards uh, public improvement projects that benefit uh, individuals within a community. Uh, so Madison County receives a certain allocation every year. And local uh, communities within the county can apply for, uh, go to the county commissioners with a project and ask uh, for these dollars uh, that 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 have that have been given to Madison County. Um, typically, there's a scoring system. I know Madison County contracts this service out, but uh, you would you would uh, score a different project based on certain criteria that were, were set. And if projects that receive the highest scores would then be awarded, uh, sometimes the whole full amount requested, other times a, a portion if, if that's all that's available for a particular project. There's also a, the uh, Community Development Block Grant Downtime Revitalization Program. This, actually, this program is actually, it, it went away in 2012 and 2014, it just started back up. So this is the first year that's back up and going. And this is perfect for a project like this focused on a downtown of a community. Um, it's it's focused on um, improving the central business district, benefiting a, a low to moderate income population and eliminate slum and blight, improves uh, blighted streetscapes, uh, rehabilitate deteriorated building facades, and address different code violations within, uh, within particular facilities. Uh, about 40% of the total CB, CDBG funds that's available throughout the state, and in, in fiscal year 14, the number in parentheses is 20 million. That was the total number that was uh, with the CDBG program throughout the entire state. So about 40% of that, you're looking at about eight grand or so, or eight million. I'm sorry. That would be, and this is a statewide competitive grant. So you're competing against communities in Northeast Ohio, uh, Toledo area, Appalachia, but uh, it's very competitive. But it's a, it's a, it's a good. Uh, funding source for a focused, um, focused project like this. And the last is a public OPWC um, local transport transportation improvement program. In small governments. Uh, Mike and I have talked a little bit. We we, you know, we think there might be some opportunities with this program. It, I think it would depend on what the project would be and how we phase the project and. And, and, and certain specifics on whether this program would qualify. Uh, but I'd like, like to like well, interject as you have Linda Bailey, who's with District 11 of WC, and literally everything we're doing here would be applicable to that program. So we could get up to half a million dollars with the grant and loan mix. That's yeah. right. In, project. Absolutely. If you look at the pro purpose, I went through the, the previous uh, projects that have been awarded funding. Um, Eligible areas of improvements include sidewalks, curb and gutter, roadway, utility relocation, and improvements, and also uh, standard decorative lighting. So that program, as Mike said, he confirmed it would be a great opportunity for this. Um, I talked about the application pro uh, process. We probably have to bump it back a year, so just adjust those years. Um, but so this is, if we get you know some momentum going now, we could definitely apply to this upcoming, upcoming uh, round. So. There are dollars out there uh, for a project like this, um, and of course my role as, as your economic development agency is to work with you to put together these grant applications, we work with Mike's office and, and see what we could, what could get for the village. 
And I, if I could interject also, there are some other innovative things in the mix too that it's a little bit premature to talk about it now, but I think whenever you do a project such as this, you want to provide for the future. And one of the things we did in Gahanna is we laid conduit uh, when the lines were being relocated and everything for, you know, future uh, cabling. You know, and actually what happens is I know Dublin's real big on this. They install the conduit and they lease it out to companies. So there's a lot of innovative things that can be done also to help offset some of the cost of you know moving the power around and things like that. But it's pretty early on in the process for that now. But um, that stuff's evolving every month it seems like. So I think you have an exciting project. Um, I think it'll the things it'll do when you open up that street uh, is just amazing. Lithopolis is probably the best example. Um, when they repaired the streets, took down those power poles, relocated the power, it just literally jump-started the whole downtown again. Um, the mayor down there is a very, very innovative thinker and um, knew that that was one of the things they had to do there. Of course, your streets actually in that stretch aren't too bad. The streets in Lithopolis had zero base to them. And they were all torn up and everything. I, you know, you'd lose a filling driving down there at the speed limit. So that was a big improvement. But you know, they had to move that life thoughtless honey fest from one day to two day limit. Just for the overwhelming enthusiasm that's going on for it. So it's it's a good impetus to give you know Plain City a new identity to make some things happen to jumpstart things and. You know, maybe somebody doesn't want to live in Marysville because of the taxes. Why not a nice place like Plain City, you know? Maybe they don't want to shop there. I mean, it's, Dublin's just getting, a little, Brian likes it, but it's getting pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, um, so anyhow. Yeah. Estimate of time that a project like this typically takes. Construction-wise? Probably about, Brian, six months, nine months? Um, for... <laughs> The actual construction would be six months or less, probably. The time frame leading into it is quite a bit more with AEP having to relocate their power poles, um, with the lead time with the signal. Um, that's the lengthy process there. So. I know everybody got sticker shock too, seeing the numbers on that, the traffic signalization equipment and everything. You'll never believe how expensive those bowls are. They're exorbitantly expensive. You think they were made out of bowl or something, but they're very complex structures. You have to have a real beefy base for the big single arm units. These are cantilevered out so much and everything. We just did a bunch up in Cuyahoga Falls, and they were, jeez, they were curved, which made them that much more expensive. But they were, I think, 85,000 a piece. <laughs> And there's steel. We all know what steel prices have done. <laughs> Can something like this be done in phases? I mean, uh, largely our ability to do this is probably will be determined by our ability to obtain the grants. Right. So, can this be done in like phased? Yeah. It could be. It, it, there are economies of scale for doing it all at once because you know you only have to bid something out once or whatever like that. So you, get, you have those costs, but. Yes, it could be. Certain you know, components of it can be based. I have to remember, though, how the cost is in electric and the poles, whether it's the intersection poles or AEP. Um, looking at the uh, preliminary cost estimate, that looks like basically an implementation cost. Um, is there pre engineering cost? Is there engineering cost? As far as looking at the site, understanding what's below the ground that you're going to possibly run into. Yes. Uh, so I'd be real interested in what the estimates for pre-engineering, for putting, finalizing the design, putting the specifications together, and coming up with the overall construction plan. That, I sense that there could be a lot of engineering costs there. There is. Typically for a project like this, too, it's around 8 to 10%. 8 to 10%. I'm guessing it's going to be closer to 8 
in this case net survey, that's utility, um, you know, investigation, things like that. But I say between eight and nine percent is a good ballpark. Those are what we call soft costs, and you were very astute to notice they weren't on there. But that does not include things during construction too, like inspection, construction administration, and such. Normally, those expenses you can get partially offset, if not totally offset, by grants and stuff. I know the Ohio Public Works Commission pays for that kind of those kind of services. So they're pretty Thank you. Sure, sure, I'm sorry. Is there a certain percentage um, the cities you've done have seen in business growth after you've done the project? I don't have exact numbers for you, but in, in the city of Cuyahoga Falls, this is, they were having one weekend festival a month, and that has pretty much gone to one, sometimes two. But in addition to that, they have events there every Friday and Saturday night now. And it was so hugely popular that when they had to more or less shut the thing down in the winter, they hired us for a phase two there where we designed a mechanically refrigerated ice skating rink that could be erected in a couple weeks' time. And they have events down there all winter long now. So I mean, it, it's really done great things there. And it, as for revenue figures, uh, really can't address that. I know one of the things they did, the billion building, the three-story building back there, mm -hmm. Your conversation earlier about restrooms and stuff, there are 85 toilet fixtures in that building. Because in the past, they were just using those portalettes and everything. Now they have nice, clean facilities there. In the upper stories of the buildings, they actually rent out to residents as, uh, as event centers. I mean, you can have high school, class reunions there, you can have wedding receptions, stuff like that. And it's actually generating cash flow. And it's, you know, Lithopolis is the perfect example. I know Leslie and Kevin went down there, and uh, I just wished we'd seen it before. Kevin found some photos on Google Earth that showed just what a mess it was before, but it's really vibrant now. I grew up there. Oh, did you really? <laughs> have you been there recently? Uh, I have not. Oh, it's probably been about two years. I think that's the reason <laughs> I have another question, please. Yes, um, I think Brian mentioned that the cost estimate in here was for the bump out option. Correct. Okay. And uh, the second option. So, we so if we were interested in the head in option, how much higher would, would it be higher? It'd be slightly higher um, because percentage? you're coming into the roadway a lot more. Okay. Um, so, a lot more asphalt work, a lot more permitting would be necessary. Um, Maybe 200. Okay. Um, if uh, now the bump out is the mid range, correct? Correct. Okay. What's the least expensive option? Uh, just the landscaped instead of a uh, brick concrete paver. So you can yeah. knock a little bit off there, um, or getting rid of those small bump outs entirely. So you're just going basically curb to curb, um, rather than bumping out into the roadway with those. The the biggest issue with the bump out from a construction and engineering uh, cost factor is you ha your water now has to find, your stolen water has to find a place to go. So you're... I noticed that in your uh, profiles there. Yeah, you're basically, you're, uh, you're putting in a lot more storm structures, uh, catch basins and underground um, storm sewer in order to handle that slope. Okay. Um, otherwise you're going to have tracked areas and puddling all over the place. So, with the landscaped option compared to the 1.6 million, I know it'd go up two if we went head in. If we went landscape, what would it do? Probably without the bump outs, probably down to okay. again very preliminary costs to begin with, and and, that, and those are the options that we want to work with council, the village. Um, <coughs> Mike always Mike's mentioned Cuyahoga Falls quite a bit. We had 50 public meetings on on that uh, Falls River Square project. For the, it involved amphitheater, a building. Uh, whether they were going to close the road or keep the road, we ended up keeping the road, putting an underground tunnel underneath the amphitheater. So, but we held 50 public meetings 
during the course of that preliminary through final design phase for that project. So, um, and those meetings were very helpful. And sorry to interject again, but one of the things that even occurred that you could do somewhere on this project is they had an area where, in this case, it was a, a fountain where they allowed whoever wanted to to buy a commemorative brick and put in this fountain. They raised a hundred thousand dollars doing that and had to shut people off. At the very last minute, they wanted us to make that thing bigger, and there physically wasn't any room to do it because they got an over, such an overwhelming response. But it's you know, the community buy-in. It's an opportunity to completely renovate the downtown and have a piece and a part of it, have your input. But some of the public meetings involve things just as generic and simple as do the seats in the amphitheater have cup holders? But that's the kind of input you want from a community. I mean, you want to get the details right. And you want to get the community buy-in. You want everybody, everybody has, you know, pretty much has a valid idea or a good idea. Get it all out. Get it implemented. And then David and I will try to figure out how to pay for it. <laughs> so uh, they're actually, like I said, fun projects. Our bread and butter is water and wastewater and, you know, road work and stuff like that. But these are the things, these kind of projects are what allow us to get, you know, take our nerd hats off and do some fun stuff. So, uh, really like working with communities, getting their ideas and implementing them. What is life on the Sonoma State route? They are not. Yeah. So they are they? Have yeah. Oh, they are, but they have their own jurisdiction within the corporate limits, just as you do here. Yeah, I was just thinking about here with this many wide loads to come through town. Yeah. Bump files are going to be really bad. Well, you you have a great base under there right now. I mean, ODOT's laid a good base under that road. They give, you, they give you 14 foot wide permit to come through town here with two 12 foot lanes. Yeah, we it's actually you have less than that right now. I, I believe you have less than that I right know. now. That's but. why I'm thinking the bump files would be even worse. No, uh, we would maintain the minimum width 12 foot. Actually, we um, lose sidewalk. You may, with the angled parking, you lose a little bit of sidewalk, plus we lose that center lane, that, as we mentioned. Um, that center lane gains you a lot if you remove it. So, but uh, you might lose, I think we laid it out where maybe a, a foot or two of sidewalk that you lose out of your 13 foot wide sidewalk. So. With, with regard to Lithopolis, you know, and again, I, you know, apples and oranges comparison by the total numbers, but what percentage was paid for just by grant alone out of their total number, if you know? That particular project was a little bit larger than yours. We accomplished half of it. They received OPWC money for that. The total was about $1.75 million, Brian? I believe so, and I believe it was uh, just under one five grant, or through OPWC, which I believe was 50-50 loan grant. So it was about 40-40 grant loan um, and 20%. I don't recall whether there were self funded through, did those. through something else. They've not done the second phase of it yet, though, but that was the phase one. Right. So in phase one, it was roughly 40% was accomplished through grant, right. and then 40% through loans, and then the balance from whatever, general fund or whatever. They're doing some innovative stuff here. They here mark the utility corridor. And there's a Ohio Revised Code now allows utilities that are in that corridor to be charged a maintenance fee every year. So what they do is they take a 20-year number of what they think it's going, and they have to justify it, but they've been able to do this, of what it's going to cost to maintain that space, and they can build the utility companies for that. And that has stopped some other things, too, like before the utility companies come in, they just rip up the roadway, you know, just saw through it and everything like that. Now there's a whole new process where they can't go and abuse it. When you're going, when you're looking at the power lines, um, you're coming in from the back, from behind the buildings, and I know that there's some alleys there. Were you able to, at least when you were doing the design layout of that, could you see that were we going to be able to access the power lines without getting additional easements? Yeah, for the most part, your alleys will suffice in tying everything in, and uh, on the, I believe it's. North side, I get my north and south confused. North side where uh, 42 um, Grub is located. 
I believe there's only three electric ties in tie-ins from the main street. Everything else is already from the rear. Okay. So. Yeah, once you move the once you move electric, phone and cable have no choice but to go along with them. I just want to make sure we're not going to have to appropriate more easements and, and do more messier things. You know, preliminarily, without getting into detailed design or anything, it does not appear so. But you know, when you put pen to paper, sometimes things will pop up. Can I piggyback on your question? How about the south side? If you move the electric from Main Street back to Bigelow, are the businesses and the residents going to have to change their service entry? And if they do, is there grants available to help them offset the cost of that? That would be part of the AEP's relocation fees. They would have to take care of that? Without, yeah, charging, to, without charging the businesses. That would be built into those costs that we have the numbers identified also already. A lot of those businesses, I, I recall, and I have to look at the map to make sure, but uh, some of those businesses back up to, I think it's Bigelow, is the next road to the south. Mm -hmm. So they're already, their property line already goes to the rear. Um, so connecting that way would be quite simple for AEP to do. Whether they're tying in from via the alley, I don't know if any tie in directly in the middle of the road. It's something we'd have to look at, but uh, that would be built into the estimate that we have for AEP's relocation cost. So to be clear, it wouldn't be passed on to the business owner? No, no. Um, and as we mentioned, we did all this for City of Gahanna when they did the Creekside project, and it was handled the same way. Um, businesses weren't charged anything in order to relocate, and they had to actually go underground. They went from overhead to underground, and that was all built into the AEP costs, and not passed on to the businesses at all. Does that answer your question? Yes, I was just, I was just wondering, because I know that some of them, I think, get service from the front. Yes. If you look at the... Uh, where the clock tower is. All of their service comes from the front. There were some that were service from the side. And the other question I had was, well, you're talking about the sidewalk. Correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong, but I believe the city only owns the first two feet of the sidewalk, and then the rest of that sidewalk is owned by the businesses. So if you start taking any more than the first two feet, what do you do? Do you have to buy that from the businesses? And is that factored in? Uh, right away, basically, it starts at the edge of the buildings. Uh, well, I don't know. I'd have to look at it. I mean, obviously, generally, the right away starts at the center line, so I don't know what, our, what the setup is. Um, I think that's what Eric ran into. Is that Eric was not a cheap. Did he only? He is, he has the sidewalk from two feet in from the curb over to his building as his, and the rest from the, the two foot out to the curb is the city. Well, but I'll put a hand on there, but no, I'm no, no. You may want to look into. What would have to be done is there would be a uh, construction easement uh, for doing a public improvement on a private property generated. Because I don't believe that any business or property owner out there would, if they knew that their business or building was going to be benefited, would have much of an objection. But they, you're correct, we'd have to look at that very closely. I think the benefits outweigh all of the oh, Definitely. Yes. Any other questions for David? Or? Well, would the electric have to be improved going into the building to, to meet the county code? It would have to be, would have to be the code. If, if it's not code compliant now. So then we're 
Right. <laughs> well, they're not going to go into the buildings to make sure that inside the buildings are code compliant. They just want to know if the connection point where their meter is is code compliant. Thank you very much. Yes. 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 No, there's there's a lot more up here all the ground. No problem. Yeah. 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 whether they get approved in a normal time frame or not. And I'm not sure if they're not current. Um, we have, have had um, change of employees, so we have got to go back and try to get back on track with some of that with the current employees and I'm trained to get things on the site. We lost also, if you recall, well, you may not recall, but we lost the individual who used to keep all that updated and we've tried, in fact, Dr. Deskowitz has offered to help us with that. We're going to have to. Well, until then, can we just send a graph off the net, notes and stick it up there like we used to by the water office and that little thing by the council offices? There are four locations, five locations. Not for the minutes. Not for the minutes. No, no, no. no, that's right. no there's not. Not anywhere. Anytime that's what I'm saying. Anybody. Yeah, anytime anyone wants to copy the minutes or they want to see the minutes, you just stop by the administrative office. If you're there for your water bill, you can ask Renee for a copy of it. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Is there someone else? I do have a question. You guys are going to help with the 4th of July with um, restrooms. Why not help the seat thrusters out? Because we signed a contract and technically those restrooms were in that contract. Well, 
detail? That's a good question. Mm -hmm. uh, Council, any thoughts? I personally see the fireworks as a public, we're putting something out for the public where the steam threshers is a private organization choosing to use our parks and we treat them as we do everyone else. But Fourth of July, I see, is completely different in the sense that we're doing it for the public. And we're doing it for the public. It is a village you can consider. Well, and we are a 501c3, and we have done a lot of work for that park, a lot. And we do bring people into the city, and the businesses do profit from the people we bring in. So the question is, the 4th of July committee, is that also a, you know, a non-profit? So it's a registered organization as well? We are a registered non-profit, yes. So Mayor, technically, then that is not a city event, right? We, we are, so if, if it's two, or two separate organizations, legally, just from a legal standpoint. It's all outside of the county. Is that how? It is. Not is that what you say? And that was legally. Probably something we should have stated when we were talking about it before, and maybe I should have piped up on it. Um, not to take away from the fact that it's a 4th of July event, and we're expecting a lot of community participation. Because of the budget cuts and everything else that we had to make over the last few years, this is a privately uh, funded event, a privately sponsored event. And Leslie, you headed up that effort to, to get it there. And so it is a privately funded organization. And um, frankly, uh, as far as your council is concerned, if you're going to uh, offer a private participate, a private um, funding or privately funded. If you're going to waive the cost for it uh, for the Fourth of July, I would. My position would be that you probably have to waive it for the steam threshers as well. No, this falls clearly under no good deed. Goes unpunished. <laughs> sure, um, Mr. Vaughn. What about when we went into the, into the contract? Were the restrooms working at that time? Yes. <clears throat> we used the restrooms last July. So since the time we signed the deal, the restrooms have kind of. Literally, they're gone, but before that, they were usable, just they're unusable. We moved forward, tore them down, so it wasn't really an option to keep them Correct. financially to fix them. We, as the park committee, we looked at that. So, would we think the same amount for the same amount of money for uh, the board bodies? How many other entities will we be doing this for? Yeah. Well, that's the question. But when we went into this business. contract, <laughs> that's my point. We entered into the contract, we had working mm -hmm. restrooms. I think from this point going forward, if we go into contract with anyone large, we would make it known to them that these other facilities use the park as is. But because we did enter that contract with the understanding of there would be adequate facilities, and now it seems that there's not. So we do have under contract to Middle House scooter, classic scooter. Show. So that's another. Mm -hmm. We went into contract. We are in working. We are in with contract with them. Which are we in contract with the Fourth of July committee? <laughs> So the problem still remains. We do it for the 4th of July. We've said the president that we do it for any and every person who claims to have a gathering at the park then. And there's no distinguishable factors because the steam pressures. Uh, I think you have to make that decision. Don't wear. Are you going to draw the line? We're only talking $335 in a bet. You is have there, to offset what Steam Thresher's done for this village. That's not the, what they're saying. I, they're not saying it's not a value. They're trying to determine how to manage a situation where, because a building had to come down due to its function, Correct. now we have to make a decision about what, how best to use village money when it comes to presented with a situation where we could have how many events a year that we spend $335 because we don't have the facilities. Well, maybe I can help narrow it down at least for half or something. Um, the scooters, are they a 501c3? I'm not sure. Steam thrushes are a 501c3. And this, is this a 501c3? Not yet. But I'm, I am hoping that we, I will not have to continually raise money for fireworks. I'm hoping the village will come back and step up and do fireworks once again. 
become really good for the people. I mean, we all live here. We'd like to enjoy the park and the fireworks, and I just don't see all this nitpicking about it. But we're paying for the fireworks, you know. It's for everybody that lives here. In Mr. Vaughn, how many folks are in contract with us now? How many organizations are in contract with us? Including those that we have already on the books that are non for profit. So, any other than we spoke about tonight? Boy Scouts. Boy Scouts. The Boy Scouts are out in the camp, then, correct? Yes. Well, it's no. They're, they're a front line. They take up the whole park. Yes. They brought in Porta Jones, too. And who brought in the Porta Jones for the Boy Scouts? They paid they, for that. Okay. My whole suggestion or my whole recommendation is that the council has to view these uh, participants in a neutral light. Um, that's our job. And so we have to look at each event. We can't look at the event or the participant. We have to look at the category or class of them and be neutral and review them so that we're treating everybody fairly. So we're not treating one group favorably or unfavorably versus others. So it could be something where if we look at the fiscal year going forward and if we're concerned about offering you know, 335 here, 335 there, 335 there, that we look at it uh, the calendar year, what do we have for the rest of this year, and, um, and cutting it off in time frame and then making that evaluation at some point later for fiscal year 2015. I'm just throwing it out there for consideration of trying to give some other options. Is there plans to restore it? Because I thought when we had discussed it previously, there was plans. The park was discussing plans to rebuild something. Well, it only takes money. So we have to figure out where that money would come from, and it's a significant amount. There's, There's been discussion in the Parks Committee of creating um, a restroom that has a kitchen or kitchenette within the same building as well as a shelter house coming out of it um, and where that would be located, perhaps putting it on the other side of the road so as to <coughs> less disturb the neighbors <coughs> to the east. Um, I think that is the, the master plan of the Parks Committee. Uh, we've discussed uh, NatureWorks grants. However, the state went from a yearly grant in NatureWorks <coughs> to every other year now. It is coming up, and that would be something I start working on in August for a NatureWorks grant for 2015. Um, I'm not sure if we're going to to be ready for that grant at that point. It's going to be, and that would have to move really quick with the Parks Committee and design and plans and all of that. So, and I'm not rushing. But that is that is the master the plan. plan, I believe, is what they discussed. So there is plans to. To reconstruct some sort of restroom facility there. Somewhere in the future. Yes. All right, Council. How do you want to leave this this evening? So the question in front of us then is do we want to basically bind ourselves to anytime anyone has anything within the park to provide them restroom services or not? Because we can't do it for some and do it for not do it for others, unless there's an exception that we can find that applies to for example, the 4th of July and not to others, and whether we want, can carve out that exception legally. So I don't know if that's something we can table until well, we get the 4th of July coming up. Well, I would say with the 4th of July, they are not a 501c. And we have said that we support that event. To date, we have said that. Um, Perhaps that's what you do this year until they become a 501c. I don't know. I mean, I don't see what the 501c3 distinction is for. Anyway, anyone can go throw the 50 bucks at the, you know, Secretary of State and call themselves a 501c3 after they get the paperwork. And Not then quite. Get, I, I mean, that. why draw that distinction? Well, that doesn't was, make a lot of sense. I was throwing out a, I was throwing out a distinction of. Some distinction, you know. Again, yeah. they, they, this is being thrown at me right now to try to come up with a, you know, get the old legal brain going here, coming up with something that uh, that uh, justifies it and treats everybody fair, fairly. Um, you've already voted on the Fourth uh, of July, and um, if it's for the steam threshers, we still have another meeting before the steam threshers come. 
Won't the porta potties still be there for the steam pressures, the ones that are currently there? They won't be behind, like Leslie said, behind there where no one's allowed to go. There will be porta potties there. But of course, it still doesn't address the issue that they we're, we're not providing them. That are you talking about the ball ones that are currently there? The yeah. yeah. Okay. And also, like the groups, like the Boy Scouts, how many Boy Scouts come out? Mm -hmm. I think we had 600. Okay. So, I mean, you're looking at Boy Scouts that have, there's two bathrooms in the youth building, and I, I assume they're all Boy Scouts. So they could use both bathrooms in the youth building and the, the bathrooms by the campers. That wouldn't be bad for that size of a group. When we're talking about Fourth of July, where we have 2,000 plus of men and women, we need the porta potty. Same we can start directions. drawing the distinctions based upon projected population to show up. I mean, we can't. How do we do that? That's that, that will be their question. If they find that you have covered the cost for another entity, that will be their question. I think, <coughs> let's say, for example, we were still putting out the 4th of July and ignoring the discussion that I think we have to have ultimately whether we choose to take it over in the future. If we were putting it on and we had no bathrooms, would we provide porta potties? The answer is clearly yes, we would provide some form of restrooms. What is different there than now? And whatever that distinction is, that's the distinction we draw now. In the sense that, what are we saying? If we're putting it on, let's say for example, uh, uh, some cities do it in conjunction with, uh, like I know Lancaster, Kroger's helps pay for a portion of it, and they sponsor it. They're paying for a part of it. And they're I mean, and, and the city is still providing all the services at the park and, you know, whatever that may be. How is that any different then than what we're doing here than if we're putting it on, albeit our part is less than, for example, in my example that Lancaster's paying for? That's a difference. Do you understand what I'm getting at? It's still our event being paid largely by an outside entity, but it's still our event, still Plain City's event. It's not the steam threshers, it is local holiday put on by Plain City. Now, I don't want to ignore Leslie's efforts because I think we all thank her largely for them, but that distinction of what any city does and accepts donations or whatever from outside entities, be it for profit or non-profit, they still do those things. And whatever allows them to do those things should allow us to do that, provide the restrooms and not open ourselves up to having to provide it for any other outside agency or organization that wants to use the park. So my question is, and I guess I would slightly disagree, I would say that the function is not Plain Cities. They, it is private donations, but it happens to take place on public property. Where do right? people we, come from? We have, well, we can say that about all this month that goes on in the park. I mean, every event that happens in our park is full of Plain City residents for the most part. So that, that argument doesn't really hold, but my question is, officially, is this one of our events? Are we, were we involved in the planning of it? Were we involved in the, uh, the event schedule? Who was going to perform, when they were going to perform? Is there any cost associated with providing uh, police and, and fire? Are we, I mean, maybe we just need to refresh our memory on is this an official event sponsored by the village of Plain City, or is this a organization that is putting on fireworks at a park in Plain City? Well, I guess not, because nobody else wanted to do it. Well, I don't know if that's It was the not case. a priority to the, to the village to have fireworks. It was not a priority to the village to have a 4th of July parade. So a handful <clears> of us <throat> stepped up to do it. Yes, but I'm asking you right now, Leslie, not to be the person in charge of fireworks. I'm asking you to separate yourself from that and be a councilwoman and not conflict the two. Because we're trying to decide what's best for the village, not what's best for your organization that you started before you became a council person. I think we all are for the fireworks, but we're trying to decide if we do it for this group, do we have to do it for every group, or are we bringing ourselves up for liability? We're already in a contract with the group. We made a contract with us when we had certain facilities, and now we don't have those facilities. This has nothing to do, really, with your specific event. It's a wonderful thing, but it is one of many events that take place in our parks. So 
So that's the question I'm asking. Is this an official Plain City event, or have we let an organization use the park for their wonderful activity that most of the community will come out for? That's the question. The second question is, liability-wise or legally-wise, since we've entered into a contract and the condition of the park has changed, and there are three. I believe I'd have to double and verify that. But three <coughs> that we have entered into when we had restroom facilities and now we don't. Do we have to somehow modify those, pay for the restrooms, or something like that? So, can can we get an official answer on this? Is the fireworks is it an official Plain City event, or is it a community organization using our parks? That's what I'd like to find. Well, I would define it as how I define it. Do we have any say in the event itself? Are we, I mean, this is not about the fourth, really. It's about are we treating every group that comes to us equally? And are we honoring our contracts that we've made? Um, you so, had your say when the city decided not to do it any longer. That's what your say was. The buildings can't do it any longer. That's when you had your say as council. All right, so it's, but thank you. But let me ask these folks up here who, um, I, because nobody, I think, on council wanted the fireworks to go away. Uh, we made cuts because there's only so many resources out there. And they weren't the only thing cut. Now, we can bring up the discussion whether we want to bring them back next year, but that doesn't still solve the problem for this year. And the other folks who are in contract with us for the park. So, does, can anybody answer the question? Is this an official Plain City event, or is it an organization using our park? I can tell you that official, I, I don't know how you're defining that, but um, in the past, when we gave money toward the 4th of July, we considered it an event that we <coughs> sponsored and supported. Um, and the same, um, I can tell you the contract that I gave to the fireworks company it is for the village of Plain City. It's supported by the committee of the fireworks. It's being paid by the village, or by the committee. But yes, but who signed that contract in what capacity was this contract signed? I is it presented it to Kevin, and Kevin said that the committee could sign it because we were paying for it. Right, you're paying for it. The village is not. The village is not, but it right. is for the village. It, it states that it is for the village of Plain City. The same way that residents of Plain City could come to your festival and enjoy what you're putting on, right? It's... It is a community festival, a not-for-profit organization that raises. So it just seems like we, we can't play favorites when it comes to big nonprofit groups that want to benefit the community, whether it be fireworks or steam pressures or motor scooters or whatever. It seems to me that's what we've always done. Well, we were, we were paying, paying for it. Or what's paying for it? How is that different? Yeah, big nonprofit that groups that want to support the village. Shouldn't the village support nonprofit groups that want to support the village? I, I agree with that. I don't see who's paying for what, how that is a distinction. It's still the 4th of July. That doesn't change anything. It's no different, like I said, than another, any other municipality accepting donations from an outside organization. Does that change the fact that it's still not the municipality putting, on, putting it on, allowing... Well, I think it, the only distinction that I see, and again, I, I'm trying not to stick my nose into a, any of what's seeming like it's going to become a policy decision, but I'm, when I'm, the only distinction that I see is when some other place, you know, some other municipality has a fireworks and has a Fourth of July festival, they, the, the municipality takes ownership of that and they hire the fireworks company. They pay for the fireworks company. They accept the donation from Kroger to pay for the fireworks. But village itself or the community itself is the one that's signing the contracts for the people to come in to put on the services and to allow everybody into the that's, that's the only distinction. And they accept the liability. Yeah, and this obviously this is an unfortunate circumstance this year where the village, you know, whatever, I mean, we're not paying for it, we're not 
hosting the fireworks. I mean, we're hosting them because people are coming to the village for it, but the village council, because of financial cuts, didn't pay for the fireworks. And so, But I your guess, citizens have paid for the fireworks this year. Right. Is there any difference between, so for the scooter show and for the Steve Fishers, they charge admission? So does that at all change the yeah. question at all for us? Yeah, I think that's a fair, very fair point. After this mess, I'm done. Yeah, I can I say it. something? Sure. You might want to check into what it would cost at Port John's put out for the summer, for the season, for the season, because a lot of the cost is the delivery and the pickup of those Port Johns, and that way, you know, bring them out the first of May, leave them till the end of October. I go out there and walk my dog all the time. It'd be a nice place. You know, it'd be nice to have Port John out there. So. And then that would cover all those events, and you wouldn't have to argue about it. Well, another thing is, the city doesn't have to pay for the fireworks this year. Somebody else is, so they ought to be able to absorb something for the community. Well, the fireworks, we've already decided they're not going to pay for them. You know, the, the question is, that, have we painted ourselves in the corner legally? But I think there's enough ground for us to say, since the other groups are charging admission. That will, I think, perhaps buy us a little time to distinguish between the two types of events where there's a page, and then we can have another meeting. Um, where we can maybe see the legal precedent on this. I think we need to look at what the cost difference is to um, having it for the summer or just for the one festival. Did, did, did you get those estimates? Or no. No, because I, we, I just threw this together this week for the art explosion over the weekend. Okay. So I think I'm hearing a common theme that we made a decision for the fireworks. We're not dealing with a time-sensitive thing that's going to take place before our next regular meeting. So there's time for a little bit of research and discussion at our next meeting. So I think we addressed the subject adequately. Paul, I would like to just ask, when you look into this, this I think the big two things that I think all of us are, so charge emission versus not charging emission. But even if they are charging emission, they entered a contract in with the village of Clinton City under the assumption that there would be working restroom facilities. So that also may change how we deal with it because whether they charge emission or not, we have a contract with them. So, you know, that, that's another thing. And then I guess maybe just the idea of this is not so, such a legal thing, but just what are the cost of just putting something in there for the summer, for the season? We can have Renee maybe or Kevin look in to see how much that might cost. Okay. I think we're ready. Motion to adjourn. Okay.